Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Katie Poser. I am the Outreach Librarian with the NOAA Central Library. We are very excited to host the next installment of the Fireside Chat series. A few logistics to get us started. Um, if Since you are an attendee, you are muted, so you cannot verbally ask any questions, but you can ask questions in the question panel, and we'll hold those until the end of this panel. If you have any technical issues, such as you can't hear the speakers or you can't see the speakers, try logging off and logging back on. That solves most issues with GoToWebinar. Also, we are recording this presentation. So if you do need to step away or like to share this with a colleague, this will be recorded and up on the library's YouTube channel. Additionally, since we are recording, any questions that you have have or comments that you make, those will be recorded as well. And if we don't get to your question, we will be passing that on to the speakers after the session. With that, I am going to hand it over to Fiona Horsfall, the director of ORTA. Great, thank you so much, um, Katie. And so good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our seventh fireside chat on transitions. Uh, as Katie mentioned, I'm Fiona Horsfall. I'm the director of the Office of Research Transition and Application. And one of our roles is to provide transition support with the objective of accelerating transitions across NOAA and simplifying the transition process in general. Um, the goal of our, our series on fireside chats on research tra transitions is to provide participants with a much broader understanding of research and development transition at NOAA. And I want to thank my staff for pulling this event together. In today's fireside chat, we'll have a discussion on the diversity of approaches to the meaning of technology used um, as needed to meet mission needs and requirements across the NOAA line offices. Uh, we'll start with remarks from Dr. Michael, who's the Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Environmental Observation and Prediction, and um, we'll follow with a conversation from our panelists for, for an in-depth look into how each NOAA line office defines operational or used as needed to meet mission requirements and uh, we will learn about successful transitions from each line office. Uh, we encourage you to ask questions through the chat box. Um, questions will be sent to me to pose to the panelists. If there's not enough time to answer all the questions, questions will be answered directly via email after the session. Uh, just as a note, on our website, we do have a feedback form and we're collecting information on transition support, including a question on uh, these fireside chats. Um, to see how we can better serve all our audiences. Now, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Michael Morgan. As Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Environmental Observation and Prediction, Dr. Morgan is responsible for providing agency-wide direction with regard to weather, water, climate, and ocean observations, including in-situ instruments and satellites, and the process of converting observations to predictions for environmental threats. Prior to joining NOAA, he served as Professor and Associate Department Chair at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. In addition, Dr. Morgan recently served on the WMO Weather Water, uh, World Weather Research Program Scientific Steering Committee. Uh, he previously served as the Division Director for the Division of Atmospheric and Geospace Sciences at the National Science Foundation, and as an AMS UCAR Congressional Science Fellow, working in the office of the US, of US Senator Benjamin Cardin from Maryland, as a Senior Legislative Fellow on Energy and Environmental Issues. Dr. Morgan is a Fellow of the American Meteorological Society. Um, he earned his um, uh, SB in Mathematics and PhD in Meteorology from MIT. So Dr. Morgan, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Fiona, and uh, good afternoon and welcome to all. I'm delighted to say a few words on the topic of today's fireside chat. That is NOAA Crossline Office Perspectives on Using Innovations to Meet Mission Needs. I see this as a really timely discussion for all of NOAA. The recently funded uh, funds provided by BIL and IRA allow us to promote innovation and economic growth external to the private sector, external to NOAA, while also it provides a really unique opportunity for us to fund innovation of our internal processes and the development of tools within NOAA that help us accomplish our mission. So thank you for inviting me to speak on this topic briefly. I recognize this is a high priority for Dr. Spinrad and NOAA headquarters. In fact, the theme really includes these two different areas which Dr. Spinrad holds as top priorities, innovation and research transition. In terms of innovation, we're looking to encourage line offices to explore how you can innovate within your own mission, as well as spur innovation in the enterprise, both within and outside of NOAA. 
We're empowering the Office of Technology Partner, the Technology Partnerships Office to help assess IP protection and create new collaborations through CRADAs. These are those cooperative research and development agreements with industry and public-private uh, partnerships that will help advance um, line office missions. For example, we have a new CRADA with Microsoft that will um, ex allow uh, for exploring ways in which we can optimize our computing efforts, exploring the use of artificial intelligence and air quality forecasts, and exploring the use of edge computing to improve scientific data processing. We'll also plan to use the IRI funding uh, with our SBIR program to seed innovation in our user industries from energy to reinsurance sectors. The FY23 SBIR call uh, calls for proposals that feature the six um, Earth System Integration Board themes as topic areas, extreme events and cascading hazards, coastal resilience, the changing ocean, uh, effects of space weather and monitoring um, and modeling the climate, uh, climate change mitiga uh, mitigation. For this call, we received 506 letters of intent across the six areas uh, from over 350 businesses. SBR funding is a key tool for de-risking early stage technology and fostering, fostering commercial capabilities within the whole, across the whole no emission. Please note, again, that we have this rare opportunity to leverage these IRA funds for exploring and ultimately exploiting new technologies to foster innovation across all line offices across NOAA. For example, adopting cloud computing or AI machine learning for research to operations and exploring new ways to integrate transformative technologies. Already, AI has uh, been seen as a proven technology for no operations applications. It spans data sources, both acoustic and radiometric, across biological and physical sciences, weather and climate, modeling, quality control of observations. What many of these applications have in common is that, uh, that they are each a workforce multiplier for NOAA allowing us to more efficiently execute our mission. Uh, one example of this is Viame, the video image analytics for marine environments, an open source system um, for analysis of underwater video and imagery for fishery stock assessment. Imagine looking at each of these um, images individually with human eyes, the type of the amount of time that would be required to look at this would make our um, stock assessments and assessments of the health of marine ecosystem almost unmanageable because of the volume of data that we would have to go through. AI has really energized that. These innovations can be manifested as new systems, processes, products, services, and tools developed across NOAA. I'm really eager to hear from the panelists on their perspectives concerning what does operational mean and the difference between that and use to meet mission objectives. We're certain to get a spectrum of answers. Recall that for any of these innovations and their emergence to things that are operational meeting mission requirements, um, there's the notion of these transition plans that are essential for describing and facilitating the transition of research and development to potential end use and really represents an agreement between researchers, operators, and users um, that describes a feasible transition pathway and potential concept of operations. And they're recommended for all these projects that are seeking to progress beyond a so-called readiness level four. Dr. Spinrad is also keenly focused on NOAA's research transition to mature our research into development to meet our operational requirements. As an example, um, there's an increasing expectation that NOAA line offices will update their NOAA research and development database, the NRDD, with project, uh, project, stat, project status regularly and include transition uh, plans where applicable. OAR and within uh, ORTA and the line, of, um, line office transition managers committee will continue to develop transition plan guidance. More resources, guidance, and training are really necessary to demystify this whole transition plan process. We may, we may investigate a little bit of that today. It is also really important to prioritize and sunset projects, those that can be transformed or are not necessarily mission critical, rather than trying to keep adding on new innovative product, uh, projects to an overwhelmed workforce. We recognize this. We cannot expect uh, no employees to concurrently work on all past, present, future projects with existing resources, people, and funding support. So thinking about how we begin to sunset projects will be important in this overall process of innovation. NOAA will better institutionalize the development of transition plans for the relevant line, off, line office program offices with resources directed um, toward R&D. So thanks again for allowing me to say a few comments. I'm really delighted to be part of this panel and understand the discussion that's gonna be emerging. And I'll turn it back to Fiona. Thank you. Um, great, thank you, Dr. Morgan, for your insights. I mean, they were certainly very valuable and um, uh, reflect ongoing discussions that we're having on the uh, Line Office Transition Managers Committee as of this morning. It is now my pleasure to introduce the panelists. 
uh, uh, Jennifer Mahoney is the director of the Global Systems Lab and Earth System Research Laboratories in OAR. Kevin Werner is the director of the Northwest Fisheries Science Center in the National Marine Fisheries Service. Margot schulz hogan is the acting director of the National Centers for Coastal Science in the National Ocean Service. And Brian Gross is the director of the National Centers for Environmental Prediction at the Environmental Modeling Center in the Weather Service. And Joe Pika is the deputy director of the National Centers for Environmental Information, um, part of the National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Service. We know it as NESDIS, that's a very long name. And uh, Captain Bill Mowat is the director of the NOAA Uncrewed Systems Operations Center in the Office of Marine and Aviation Operations. So um, with that, I'm going to now turn to the questions. And our first question, um, and I will circulate the question um, to each of the panelists in the order that I have presented them. What technological innovations do you anticipate will have a significant beneficial impact on your line offices accomplishing their respective missions? Please provide some examples or use cases you think may demonstrate how the innovations will enhance mission success. So I'm going to hand it to Jen. All right, good morning, everyone, or afternoon, I guess, depending on your, your location. Thank you, Fiona. Well, that's a great question. Um, as a director of the Global Systems Laboratory, we're really, our mission is to develop forecasts and tools and technologies that deliver solutions. So in that context, um, moving our technologies to operations is extremely important, and we've done that for many, many years. Two of the specific areas we work in uh, are our model development, as well as our um, forecast tools that actually find their way onto the forecaster's desk at the National Weather Service. So we work a lot with our partners. Uh, I have several of my partners on the line today, uh, Brian being one of our our main partners, as well as Joe, uh, working to develop our uh, models as an example, really using innovative technologies, new ways of putting models together, and um, delivering those through um, what we're going to call the Unified Forecast System to the National Weather Service. So to answer your question specifically, a couple new things that GSL is working on are um, our high resolution models, again, putting that through this UFS process that is a new community-based activity for developing those models uh, and working with Weather Service to get them into operations, as well as the next generation of our AWIPS type technology, uh, and that is hazard services. Hazard services is gonna be a new way for the forecasters at the desk to put together forecasts that are targeted uh, with specific applications and um, emergency information that will be delivered to the public. So we're working right now. One thing I do want to say is our partnerships are so extremely important and we cannot do it without a very close relationship with those that are going to receive our technologies as we're developing those innovations. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I'll um, thank you for that information. I'll turn it over to Kevin. Thanks, Fiona. Thanks for the invitation to be here. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is such an important and big question, so I'll try to keep my remarks brief here. Um, for NOAA National Marine Fisheries Service, um, I guess I should say just a little bit about what our mission is. Um, our mission focuses on the science and management to support the nation's federally managed fisheries under the Magnuson-Stevens Act. Um, that's one component of the mission. The second component is so conservation and protection of resources under the Endangered Species Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act. So these are obviously marine mammals, but also other listed species in the Northwest. This is this includes, a, um, well, in the West Coast, this includes 28 different salmon species. Um, and then aquaculture is another major component of our mission space. And this is really supporting the development of the, the nation's aquaculture industry. So how do we do that? What are the what are the what are the techno technological innovations to answer the the question? Um, they run a, <laughs> there's a there's a wide range of these. I'm just I'm just going to give a few and, and highlight some examples. Um, and I don't mean to um, suggest that these are the only ones. Um, so first, I'm going to I'm going to talk about genetics, genomics. Um, this is a, a strength of of the Northwest Fisheries Science Center. 
Um, we have a long-standing genetics program that, that's historically looked and currently looks at genetically identification of, of different species that go in the Endangered Species Act. More recently, we've been investing in environmental DNA. So this is a, a way of looking at water samples and, and looking at the DNA um, of, of samples within that water sample. So you can tell what critters have essentially gone through the water recently. Um, and this is something we've been testing for several years now. Um, and this is it's, it's, it's something that's in the larger field as well. And, and the, the potential um, impacts on our mission are huge. If we could use eDNA to sample water, either instead of or in addition to our traditional fishery surveys where we're out catching fish, um, that that would sort of revolutionize how we, how we do fishery surveys and how we support the, the management of both our, our fisheries mission space as well as our protected resource mission space. Um, second area I wanted to talk briefly to is the artificial intelligence machine learning. Um, Dr. Morgan mentioned Viami. Um, that's one example of, of how we've used AI ML in the, in the NOAA fisheries um, mission. Another example I would cite is, is looking at acoustic data, um, which like the video data that Dr. Morgan talked about, um, acoustic data is something we've, we've been collecting for many years on our fishery surveys and our ecosystem surveys. And we um, historically have hand analyzed those acoustic data um, to determine where where fish are, where fish are not. And, and we're increasingly looking at using AI ML to, to do that. And that's um, another area that could revolutionize how we, how we do our mission. <laughs> um, I'll go more quickly through a couple other examples. Um, UXS, I expect Captain Moat will talk to this in more detail, um, but this is an area we, we've been looking at extensively. Um, how do we augment or supplement our, our surveys, both um, riverine and marine um, surveys with, with UXS technologies? Um, we're interested, I'll just flag the riverine side, that we, we are interested in, in how salmon move up and down our river systems past, high, past dams and that sort of thing, and, and, and using UXX, techno, UXX technologies in the riverine systems is important for us, as well as the marine environment. Um, modeling advances, Margo talked to this, or not Margo, sorry, <laughs> Jennifer talked to this. Uh, we also do modeling. Um, we do stock assessment modeling. We do ecosystem modeling, um, and, and we're continually advancing those, those modeling approaches, much as the, the weather climate side of the agency are as well. Um, and there's more. And I'm going to just wrap up with two quick other things. Data. Data is super important to us. We're investing in OpenScapes. We're investing in open science. We're investing in data access. Um, as, as we collect more and more data through these advanced technologies, um, we need to be able to analyze and, and, and serve that data. And then the last thing I want to call out um, is social science and the people. And understanding how people work throughout this enterprise is, is super important for us. Um, both people outside our science enterprise, but also ourselves, and understanding how how science is, is how science works, how it's changing, um, that's an important area of investment for us as well. And I'm going to stop there. Thanks, Kevin. That was an awful lot, <laughs> but thank you, um, Margot. I'll hand it to you now. All right, great. Uh, thank you also for the invitation. I think it's a very timely topic. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the National Ocean Services uh, skills here. Uh, just to set the stage a bit, uh, NOS has a very broad mission across its eight program offices. Unlike some of the other line offices, all of our program offices are national in scope as opposed to regional. Uh, so that makes us a little bit different. Uh, and the range and, and mission of the eight program offices is quite varied. Um, to name just a few, uh, the National Geodetic Survey measures gravity and maintains the National Spatial Reference System upon which all GIS measurements are based. Uh, the Office for Coast Survey conducts extensive hydrographic uh, mapping and cares and, and produces the nautical charts that you know we all know and love. Um, the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries and Office for Coastal Management help conserve and, and manage the ocean and coast special places. Uh, and that, that's just a few. Uh, and so the, the technological innovations across NOS are, are similarly broad and, and diverse. And I'm just going to name a few here as well. Um, some of the more exciting ones to me are like the use of uncrewed platforms to respond to oil spills in ice environments. Uh, this will allow us to determine the presence of oil and its thickness in waters both above and below the ice to support trajectory modeling, cleanup, and assessment of marine resources uh, in the Arctic. As the human footprint in the Arctic expands, our ability to 
assess and track oil is going to be ever more critical. And that's one of the prime missions of our Office of Response and Restoration. Uh, NCOS, the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science, which is my office, is putting a lot of effort in marine spatial planning now in support of wind energy siting for the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Uh, this uh, ocean spatial planning collects the, the data across as many ocean users as we can collect, um, prioritizes and models those uses to try and deconflict the use of that space moving forward. Uh, we're working hard to represent NOAA's trust resources across the spectrum, uh, including critical uh, habitats like essential fish habitat, sanctuaries and estuarine reserves uh, through fisheries and, and protected resources. Um, this is uh, in support of the administration's priority on offshore wind. Um, the National Geodetic Survey's GEOID 2022 uh, is a geopotential model using gravity data that enables users to measure land elevations and water depths, including tidal water level heights that are crucial for marine navigation and coastal zone management. Uh, NCOS is also working with NESDIS, a partner, uh, to improve satellite data algorithms to help monitor harmful algal blooms so that state and federal partners can mitigate those impacts on recreation and drinking water supply and, and seafood harvests. Most recently, we're expanding monitoring to Lake Okeechobee in Florida, where the discharges have been a major issue for, for our state and federal partners there. Uh, and I'll conclude with another example that's kind of multiple offices within NOS we're contributing to a 40-year reanalysis of coastal flood frequency, which will build a national assessment tool for contemporary and future coastal flooding in support of climate-ready coasts and resilient communities. I'll turn it back to you. Great. Um, thank you. Thank you, Margot. Um, I'm going to pass it now to Brian, and I just want to say that um, you know part of the big question and what we've heard so far is that the Weather Service has always had the mantra on time in real time all the time and um, that's very different to what we've heard from the other lines so um, Brian that's probably a heavy thing to put on you but I'm going to pass it to you now. Oh, thank you um, I was just going to ask the other line offices why they don't have a similar statement like that but that's okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm Brian Gross uh, I am with the Environmental Modeling Center which is one of the national centers for environmental prediction in the Weather Service uh, and so my background is in modeling, and I will speak mostly to modeling, but of course the Weather Service, as Fiona just said, has a much broader mission than that. Uh, it spans the value chain of, of observations, ingesting those observations for use in predictions, building modeling systems for those predictions, developing products, and then communicating weather-related information to our stakeholders. Um, that entire chain is in the scope of the Weather Service, but I'm going to stick with the, the modeling side of things. So um, we consider innovations in numerical weather prediction or, or NWP uh, in a number of different areas. First and foremost is something that Jen touched upon. Um, and this is how we understand the way that the Earth system works. Uh, it used to be just the way the, the atmosphere works, but we're moving beyond just the atmosphere into Earth system thinking. And so understanding how all of the Earth system, Earth components are interconnected and expressing that understanding in numerical models is really our, our bread and butter. And EMC in particular uh, is the penultimate stop uh, before operations, where we harden the models for operations. Uh, we make sure all of the technology uh, and IT requirements are being met in order to provide the numerical guidance on time, all the time, every time. Um, and so that's, a, uh, that, that's an important function, but we cannot do it without our other partners, right? The folks that provide those innovations in particular. Um, as we expand into Earth system modeling, um, we, we anticipate having stronger collaborations with NOS for, because we want to be able to predict, for example, sea ice in the Arctic for navigational purposes. We, are, we want to be able to predict uh, the impact of seasonal ocean prediction on fish stock. So we're going to be talking uh, NIMS. Um, we use a lot of satellite data and how we use that satellite data is an important collaboration with, uh, with NESDIS. And OMAO provides a lot of uh, in situ observations of burgeoning phenomena, things like atmospheric rivers. We're exploring the use of aircraft observations and enhancing our prediction of atmospheric rivers 
as well as the operational augmentation of, of uh, observations in, in hurricane prediction uh, by OMAO. And of course, OAR is a key research partner uh, for us. Um, some of the other uh, areas where we look for innovation uh, are computational performance, um, as well uh, because it matters how quickly you can get the modeling systems to completion in operations, uh, and the ingest of new data types in order to improve model initial conditions and provide a different source for ver verifying uh, our model output. So uh, I'm going to go back to, to something Jen was talking about, uh, the unified forecast system. Um, a key aspect of this is, you know, we can't do it alone. Even NOAA can't do it alone. So the unified forecast system is, is a community-based uh, set of tools, components, modeling systems that pretty much the entire national numerical weather prediction enterprise can access and innovate with. So the idea here is, we get innovations across NOAA. We get innovations from across some other federal agencies. We get innovations from academia, and we may even get innovations from the private sector. It is this entire enterprise that we are looking for to help us innovate and improve the operational numerical weather prediction systems. So that's one area where, where we're, looking, uh, uh, we're looking to innovation. Uh, another area is uh, uh, another technique that, that you've already heard about uh, across the disciplines, and that is artificial intelligence and machine learning. There are a host of modeling activities where this can uh, provide innovation within the modeling systems uh, in, in a couple of areas. Some of it is just pure computational performance. Right? We can accelerate uh, things like physical parameterizations, cloud physics, other atmospheric parameterizations in our models to become more efficient uh, we can also uh, become more efficient in how we use observations, uh, areas like specific processing of uh, observing systems like radio signs, uh, data thinning. There's an awful lot of data that comes from satellites, right? And sometimes it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to ingest all of it. We want to know which ones are most important to the forecast process. So there's another application of, of artificial intelligence um, and machine learning. And then, then finally, there are other areas in the National Weather Service besides just modeling where, where this innovation is such a, a key piece. Uh, this includes the development of new products. How do we communicate the information to our stakeholders? So not just from the, the guidance systems, but also from the forecast offices, right? What is the best way to get the message across to our stakeholders, right? And understanding how to communicate things like probability and risk. Um, does it make sense for you to know that the prediction is 72 degrees tomorrow at 2 p.m., or would you be able to use a range, a probability statement that there is a 70% chance that the temperature at 2 p.m. is going to be 72 degrees, and so forth? Um, so this is, you know, this is just a variety, uh, some of the variety of ways that we're looking to, to innovate in the National Weather Service. Back to you, Fiona. Thanks. Um, great. Thanks, Brian. Um, I want to pass it to Joe now. Uh, thank you very much, Fiona. And good afternoon, good morning to everyone. Um, so I, I'm Joe Pika and work for, for NESDAS, uh, Satellites and Information. And so a, as you've heard a little bit from uh, some of my colleagues, we kind of work uh, uh, upstream in some of those satellite observations that we provide real time, all the way to preserving the data uh, for, for long-term analyses. And, I'm going to start a, a little bit different than some of my colleagues, and as opposed to just talking strictly about the benefits, some of these technical, technological innovations are, are, are bringing those benefits, but also they come with some significant challenges. Uh, and, and one of them is the increase in volume and diversity in data uh, in particular. So our own, even our own data is growing in its uh, resolution, both spatially and temporarily. Um, it's it's coming from partners, it's coming from private sector, whether it be uncrewed systems, citizen science, that you heard eDNA, acoustics. Um, and, and let me just provide a little reference uh, going back in time. In uh, 2000, the NOAA data archive was half a petabyte. In 2010, it was two petabytes. In 2020, it was 36 petabytes. At the start of 2023, it's 55. 
and we predict, uh, well, you see, you see where it's going. We predict over 500 petabytes uh, by the end of the decade. So how do we how do we deal with that incredible growth uh, and diversity uh, in data? And, and some of those tools have been mentioned: uh, the cloud, data science, AI, ML. Uh, and, and we're really looking forward to utilizing those. So in Nesdis, we are assembling a common cloud framework to provide us with the infrastructure to scale with that demand. And it's not just demand for storage. Uh, I don't I don't want to just highlight that. It's also being able to uh, take data from multiple sources, blend it, integrate it, uh, so that we have a, a comprehensive digital understanding of the planet that meets user needs, uh, that, that feeds into the models or that we use. Uh, at NCEI, we also host the NOAA Center for Artificial Intelligence, a community of practice where we share some of these lessons learned uh, that's been talked about by Dr. Morgan, like the, the, the video uh, uh, analysis that we do, uh, that kind of tool. I'm particularly interested in the natural language processing. How do we let AI help us do data stewardship, uh, you know, preserve that data using some of those tools? I'm also excited about the AI Ready standard that we've been developing uh, in the in the community of practice with the Earth Science Information Partners. Uh, it, it's going to be really important as we go forward in this you know, large volume of data uh, and information to be able to pull out uh, information. So Brian mentioned uh, the thinning of data so it can be used uh, in the models, but what how can we do that in a smart way? So not just that it can be used in the models, but it can be combined with social science data with uh, uh, vulnerability infrastructure data that other agencies or other uh, institutions used. Uh, so this this is going to help us going forward. And I just want to I want to highlight an example. I don't I want to focus on the challenge, but one of the benefits of this and uh, our most recent uh, uh, normals uh, you know computation. So every every ten years you create uh, precipitation normals, uh, and this this provides all of us a context for your daily weather. Is it, uh, are we getting more rain this month than, than we have in the last 30 years, et cetera? And in this last tranche uh, of doing this, we were able to include citizen science, the Kokoraz network, as well as the Department of Agriculture snow tell sites uh, in that. So 5,400 citizen science observation stations um, were incorporated in those normals. They met the long-term standard in quality, not all of them, uh, but being able to utilize the various sources, not just our own uh, data, is one of the innovations that we've been able to bring into our routine production. I'm, I'm not sure I'd call it operations. I would call it routine uh, productions, but then that supports weather service observation, uh, operations and providing context to the American people. So that's, that's an example of, uh, of, of one of the things we have been able to utilize, some of this new new information from partners, from citizens ob observers, crowdsourcing, uh, to, to feature in our authoritative uh, climate products. And I'll, I'll stop there. I know we uh, uh, have one more uh, colleague to go. Thank you so much, Joe. And I just want to point out that I installed my Coco Raz rain gauge um, just last summer and waiting to become part of the network as well. We call us Weather Weenies Anonymous. OK, I'm going to hand it over to Bill. Hi, thanks, Fiona. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. So again, uh, Captain Bill Mowat, I'm the director of OMEO's uh, Uncrewed Systems Operations Center, and I I really like sort of like batting last year. Um, this is a good position to be in because I heard lots of things um, from the earlier presenters that that uh, you know gave me a couple of thoughts. And so, you know, um, Kevin talked about um, salmon in riverine systems and yeah, we've got a we've got a project for that. We're working on uh, working with George Pest, Kevin, on uh, mapping some uh, salmon habitat in the Northwest. There, we talked about um, oil spill response. Uh, it's a project that we're working on. Um, it worked on with the, the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. And uh, Brian, you talked about air sea interactions and modeling the Earth system. And we've got a lot of effort pointing at studying air sea interactions right because that's going to be a key piece of that puzzle i think so um i'll say i really enjoy working at omao we're we're a force provider right so we don't hold a NOAA mission necessarily we enable other parts of NOAA to do its mission uh, by providing ships and aircraft 
and now by providing uh, uncrewed systems. And so uh, as a result of that, we get to work across all these different uh, NOAA mission areas. And that's, that's my favorite part about the agency is it's really diverse set of missions, really important missions, and we get to work with all of them. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. Um, so with uncrewed systems, there's really two things that NOAA can do with uncrewed systems, or two broad buckets. One is we can do what we're already doing, uh, but do it more efficiently or more productively uh, with an uncrewed system. And so uh, an example of that is by creating, um, taking an uncrewed surface vessel and teaming it up with a ship, making a ship plus USV team, for our hydrographic surveys and for our fisheries acoustic surveys. Now we've got two sonars kind of going for the price of one. And we've got a bunch of ocean lawn to mow out there. Now we have two lawn mowers working instead of one lawn mower, you can mow the lawn a lot faster that way. So that's uh, just, it's the same sensors, same data. We're just kind of changing where the people sit, um, but we can do things a lot more efficiently. We think that can improve the productivity of our hydrographic survey ships by up to 40 to 50%. So really significant increases in productivity. Uh, on the fish side, the Alaska Fisheries um, Pollock Survey, you know, the biggest uh, fishery by volume in the US, traditionally takes 60 days to do uh, with a ship by creating a ship plus USV team. We think we can get that survey done in 40 days. Now, when the climate changes and the fish move and your lawn gets bigger, you can still mow the lawn uh or that ship can go do something um you know there, there's plenty of there's plenty of work for the big white ships so they're they, they're free to do something else by creating that those gains in productivity and efficiency the uh second thing you can do with uncrewed systems is get data that you just couldn't get any other way and i think noah is doing a lot of this uh in relationship to hurricanes with uncrewed systems so we've got um, we, NOAA, has a three-pronged approach to this. So um, understanding the lower part of the storm, our crewed aircraft can fly into hurricanes, uh, but they can only go so low. And if you think about the part of the storm we care about is the bottom part. That's where all our stuff is. That's where we are in the bottom 100 meters of the storm. So understanding that the dynamics of that part of the storm are really important. Can't get a crewed aircraft there. Um, we had great success working with AOML and some private sector partners launching uh, a small UAS in Hurricane Ian. I was able to circumnavigate the eye wall, spent two hours in the eye wall, um, and we're really excited about what that data might mean for improving our understanding of, of storm uh, physics and dynamics. At the air-sea interaction, again, very hard to measure in a hurricane, but working with private sector partners with SailDrone and again with uh, partners in, in OAR, um, able to get, we had seven sail drones in the water last year, sort of trying to intercept, I, th I think of them like wide receivers in football, they're like trying to go where the hurricane's going to be and, and get in its way and, and get some really critical and interesting data from on that air-sea interaction in the heart of the storm itself. And then finally below the surface, I think most folks understand you know, ocean heat content really can drive hurricane intensity, working with partners in IUS and in, in NOS, with the Navy, with some uh, university partners, with AOML. Uh, we have uh, a series of hurricane picket gliders out there measuring ocean heat content. And again, helping improve our um, understanding of hurricanes and hopefully improving uh, intensity forecasts. So all of that is data that we really couldn't get without uncrewed systems. So it's that Kind of that second bucket of, of doing things uh, getting data we just couldn't get any other way um, and then there's sort of three different ways to do it uh, you can either couple your uncrewed system with an existing asset so launching a small uas from a crewed aircraft or making that ship plus usv team you can also have uxs can stand on their own and and gather critical NOAA data so uh, the Southwest Fisheries Science Center in the, in the Antarctic has stopped using ships to measure krill abundance. They do it all with buoyancy gliders now. We're working on a project with them to adopt the same approach uh, for the Cal Coffee project in California. If you can do it in Antarctica, you can probably do it in San Diego, and, and you can probably do it everywhere. 
really, right? So I think there's a an opportunity for NOAA to grow um, a sort of comprehensive ocean ecosystem assessment capability in support of uh, fisheries management there. And that, but that's independent, no, no crude systems required there. And then finally, you can work uh, with the private sector. So a, a really important area for us uh, in the new area of funding from Congress, we have $7.5 million this year for what we're calling uncrewed marine system services. It's basically data as a service. Uh, so we're in the process of making those allocation decisions, but doing things like mapping for offshore wind or um, some of this hurricane work or uh, understanding our Arctic ecosystems better. All things we can do with private sector partners uh, to help advance NOAA's missions with uncrewed systems. So um, I'm excited about the potential here and uh, yeah, happy to talk more. Great, thank you so much, Phil. And, and um, one of the uh, ORTA mantras is that the future of Earth observations is with uncrewed systems. And um, uh, it's our innovation, research and development and in, of innovations that will keep NOAA and the United States as a global leader in this area. So I want to point out that we've heard many examples of use um, across NOAA and the need for advancements or basically transitions of new ideas and technologies to improve our mission. I want to pass it back to Dr. Morgan before I go to the next question to see if you have any thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Um... Yeah, one of the common themes that seemed to emerge from this was, um, just as the uh, captain just uh, alluded to, was these uncrewed systems, the uses of the, of the uncrewed systems. We heard about AI and ML, um, artificial intelligence machine learning, as being a set of innovations that can um, help transform how we do our processes. And also, the other very important part of this with respect to model development and working with the community, there's also this notion that the innovation that we see within NOAA can also be fostered and also occurs outside of NOAA. And it's up to us to make sure we can grab those great ideas. So for the modeling development part of it, working with this data as a surface, working with private sector partners to bring that data in, I think those are some important um, aspects of what I've heard so far in this discussion. But recognizing that um, these new, these innovative technologies really allow us to do our job to increase the productivity of what we do, the workforce here within NOAA can do, as well as just more efficiently uh, conduct our work. So I think this is a, um, you know, I think these innovations that we've heard and how they're being applied are sort of right on, on the mark. And I guess the next part of this is discussing the transitions. So thanks. Great. Um, thank you so much. I am going to pose another question. Um, we're probably pushing um, our time, but um, I think this is a, another important issue. Um, so R&D developed in NOAA is conducted in support of the mission, whether it be a contribution to further the research, some type of knowledge transfer, uses needed to meet mission requirements, and we've certain heard, certainly heard uh, many examples of that, and that includes data collection, and also operations. Uh, within your line office, do you consider transition of R&D to use to meet your mission? What do you consider to be R&D to use uh, to meet your needs and if you could provide an example. So um, we'll probably uh, use less time for each answer so that we can get to some audience questions. Um, again, I'm going to start going around the way I started and I believe that I started with Jen. All right, thank you, Fiona. You know, the transfer of technology for use is really broad and we have a variety of ways of thinking about that transfer to use. You know, where I, where I sit in our laboratory in GSL, our transfer to use is picking up a technology, working with, you know, our partners and actually delivering that technology into more of an operational platform. But we also know that you can deliver that technology to use through our publications, and publications are extremely important, as well as um, knowledge, just transferring knowledge through the collaborations that we work on with our partners. And one thing I wanted to point out as far as a transfer of use idea, and that is through our test beds. I think it's really important to recognize the importance of the test beds in the transition of our technologies, testing them, bringing the community to the table to talk about the problems that we're working on, because the delivery of however we deliver this, we need it to be useful for that end user. And the best way to get that is to bring those end users to the table 
get their requirements, have them sit down and play with whatever we're working on so that we know when we're ready to deliver this that it has been tested and those users are, are in, you know, have been in the loop. And that's been a key aspect uh, for the success, I think, that our lab has had in OAR, particularly in getting those technologies used. Great. Thank you, Jen. Uh, I'll hand it to Kevin. Thanks, Fiona. Um, and yeah, I agree with Jen. This is a very broad question. Um, I would say for us and NOAA Fisheries, we do much of our own science in the Science Center. So we are, in a lot of cases, our own stakeholder for R&D um, transition. An, an example I cited before in terms of the eDNA or the UXS, um, we're developing technologies to improve the way we do our own surveys and our own stock assessments and our own modeling efforts, right? So um, I you know, I, I'd point out those. I, I give one other example, and, and I'll be quick here. I didn't talk about aquaculture before, but we we use the creative process through the NOAA Technology Transfer Office um, to partner with with industry and with tribes in the Northwest on aquaculture methodology development. So we've been prototyping for the last decade um, uh, sablefish aquaculture methodologies, and we're working hand in hand with our partners in the private sector and in the tribes to transfer those methodologies that we're developing in terms of physiology and genetics and and and, and process growth for for building that aquaculture species um, into the marketplace and, and that's you know we we do that through the, again the creative process in NOAA um, and I will stop there back to you Fiona great um, thank you Kevin that's super interesting that you're working so closely with the tribes on that and of course um, uh, TPO, the Technology Partnerships Office, is within ORTA as well. So, um, Margo. Yeah, so um, I think we have a similar a broad sort of response. And I think for NOS, R&D to use uh, is really the provision of that quality, reliable product, service, model, or data at the temporal and spatial scale that the user needs. And that goes from, you know, every beach every day for some have forecasts to once uh, once a year for a, a report or every five years for a condition assessment for a sanctuary. So it really is very tailored to what the users need and that is set at the, the point where we begin. And so we know um, you know what that that scope of work is and what the, the transition will be. Um, specific, specific transitions run the gamut from transition to operations, uh, including you know, advanced modeling capabilities, ocean observing platforms, uh, for navigation or coastal hazards, harmful algal blooms, uh, hypoxic events, and again, the, the tempo of that delivery is, is dependent on what the user needs are. Um, and we also have research to applications, so development of models or habitat characterizations in support of um, marine protected area designations, uh, the delivery of siting tools for offshore wind planning, uh, or to drive resilience through platforms like, like Digital Coast. Um, we also have some research to commercialization, um, similar using some of our labs for testing technology um, in an experimental or demonstration environment. An example of that would be our harmful algal bloom uh, control technologies in our Hollings Marine Lab. Uh, that's also through a, a CRADA as well. Uh, and last, we have uh, the information transfer, um, knowledge transfer through understanding and development of best practices with a recent example being the engineering with nature analysis in partnership with our other federal partners. Um, transitions, similar to what Kevin said, we're often our own customer. Uh, we're within a single program office with a, maybe a transition of an improved model, uh, ingestion of additional data. Uh, it can be a cross program office as well or, or to another federal agency and, and then also to, to the public. I mentioned drinking water managers or harmful algal bloom forecasts knowing when they need to treat the water. Uh, so there's a, a variety of, of customers and, and who the users are for, for NOS as well. I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Great. Well, thank you, Margo. Um, Brian, would you like to address this? Sure. Um, so, you know, use in the weather service has a number of different meetings, uh, meanings. Probably the the best one to think about is the delivery of information or stakeholders that can impact decisions, right? Impact-based decision support services or IDSS. Uh, and this is what forecast offices do, what the national centers do, and so forth. 
Um, EMC as a modeling shop actually doesn't do any of this. So in that sense, we really aren't operational. However, it is pretty easy to define our world of, of use to mean these modeling innovations that make it into the operational modeling systems that are run on the uh, supercomputer, WCOS, right? So Weather Service has a host of these, National Ocean Service has, has a host of these. So when a modeling innovation is being run in operations, that is considered a success um, and a, a good definition of use. But it's not just modeling innovations, right? So I mentioned earlier, it's important to, to be able to recognize the importance of new sources of data. I'll, I'll give another example of this. Um, Bill was talking about sail drones um, earlier on. And uh, you know, ocean observations in our world are very precious. Um, so it's important for us to be able to use any, any one of the, as many of these as we can, I should say. Um, so uh, at EMC, we uh, began the process of building the plumbing and the modeling capability to ingest sail drone data. Um, and we are on track to make that operational uh, in one of the next upgrades of the global system. But we could not have done that without the support of our partners, and specifically, um, you know, Orta um, at, offered us uh, a pilot project and funding to bridge that last gap from where we were in the penultimate step actually into, into an operational system. So um, that would be another definition of use in our case. We had a new observing system and we're actually gonna be able to adjust it and use it uh, in operations. And, and we couldn't have done that without the partnerships um, that we have across, across the line offices, specifically with OAR uh, and Orta. Um, thanks, Brian, and thanks for mentioning the bridging program because it was very important for us to get that data across the valley of death into the operational models. Um, so, Joe. Yeah, I, mean, I think I'm going to uh, pick a couple of examples like that, and, and I'll start with uh, with Bill and the uncrewed systems. One of the, the things we do is work with partners, so cooperative institutes, uh, academia, to uh, bring that across, and right now we do have a a partnership with the University of Southern Mississippi uh, for uh, building a UXS uh, data assembly hub. So that's that's one example, and and it takes close coordination and oversight to make sure that it's going to fit into that NESDIS Common Cloud framework that I that I mentioned, so that it can be incorporated with the rest of the data. I was going to bring up one other area that's that's a little bit unusual, but it goes with the community of practice. I mentioned the the NOAA Center for AI. But even the NOAA Environmental Data Management uh, Group, every year there's workshops uh, that we have. And during those, we'll have hackathons, we'll have you know, idea paloozas, and we'll try to come up with you know, uh, items that will address a specific challenge uh, in those. And I think that's one area where we do try to uh, come up with just some interesting ideas across the community that can be shared or, or, or may try and uh, you know, cut across some of the challenges we face, particularly with uh, uh, data management. Thanks. Great, thanks, Joe. I'm gonna pass it to Bill. Yeah, thanks. Um, I guess a, a couple of thoughts in this, and you know, been a couple of mentions of like the valley of death or or the, the difficulties of the last stages of, of transition. And that's something that, yeah, that I've definitely seen in my time working in the, in the uncrewed systems world. Um, so, it, you know, it's something that we're focused on here at, at OMAO. Uh, last year, we were a $14 million office and about $11 million of that went into transition projects. So trying to take things that are in sort of like late stages of, of demonstrations, you know, we've demonstrated sort of a product market fit. We think it's gonna, you know, this is gonna work, but like it's all these, data assimilation and, and really challenging things related to operate, uh, operationalizing things that, that we're focused on. So, um, you know, one area that I repeatedly see a challenge, I think, with NOAA is in the demonstration of value phase. So we can show that, you know, the robots can go out, they can, they can gather the data, it looks good, okay, this looks like it's gonna work, but now it's gotta compete you know, with every other NOAA priority out there for, for funding um, to, to make it happen. And so finding um, the resources to, to, 
to sh make those demonstrations of value. And in cases where it's something like the U Ship Plus USB team, same sensor, same data, it's, it's, it's like a business case thing. It, it's not that hard. In other cases where it's new data that we haven't been able to get before, all this hurricane stuff, you know, we have to do data impact analysis and OSSEs and really understand, you know, is and how much is this driving forecast improvement and is the expenditure to go get this new data, you know, worth it for those forecast improvements? And that's like, that's a hard part to fund is that last little piece. Everyone want, wants to make the robots go. Um, it's harder to get funding for the science that, that needs to happen to assimilate the data and, and understand it. So, um, you know, we're working on an RFP this year in conjunction with um, the UXS Research Transition Office. It's a partnership between our two offices. It covers the full spectrum of research, development, testing, evaluation, and transition. And we do have a piece set aside of that RFP for this demonstration of value work. So not making robots go, but doing the science to show the value, to develop pull for these systems. We've got a lot of people pushing on this rope. We need, need some help developing some pull on this rope. So, and we do that through things like OSSEs and, and data impact analyses. So, I see that as, as sort of a key missing piece right now, and, and you know we're working in partnership with OER to address it. Um, great, thanks, Bill, for mentioning that. Yes, that's very exciting about the the joint RFP that we're working. Orta's Uncrewed Systems Research Transition Office is working with your office. We really do want to see innovations there. Um, I'm going to note that there was a you know you both all have a, um, presented a tremendous variety of transition of research and development to use across NOAA, and they're all mission driven and responsive to user needs. We certainly heard that as well. So now I'd like to go to the questions from the audience um, to see if there are any, and I believe, Katie, you're going to um, present those to the, to the panelists. Yes, I will touch on the first question, which I did put in the chat for everyone also to read. But here we go. Dr. Morgan touched on sunsetting existing programs to give innovative activities the resources needed to thrive. As NOAA, in many cases, is bound by law to produce observations and measurements, how do we as an agency manage the difficult process of maintaining world-class data collection while being agile enough to make the leaps to the next technologies? Thanks for that question. Um, and I just begin with, of course, we can't ignore existing statutes. So unless we can, um, so we have to continue along with what we've been doing with respect to particular data collections and particular observation sets. But I say that unless we can, um, it's only unless we can successfully argue that a, a new um, observational record or model, to look at observations or good models can be supplanted by a more capable technology. And so to be able to, to um, make progress and being agile enough to move forward to new technologies, I think really going back to some of the comments I made at the very beginning, um, it's really taking advantage now of the new resources we have to begin exploring these additional these other options for data collection. So careful characterization of our current data, and we've already done that because we, most of that data gets used and assimilated into models, knowing the error characteristics, including the biases, really characterizing the old data sets, the new data sets, looking at the relationship between them. And in some of these cases, we may be able to argue this is a much more um, this is a data type that can be uh, can supplant something that we've already been doing, but we can't ob obviously ignore existing law statutes that say that we must provide this particular type of data. But we have to really be clear, is it really our, our wish to continue doing things the same way we've been doing them, or is it really a legal requirement that prevents us from doing that? But again, taking advantage of the new funds that we have to explore more innovative ways of doing what we do, observation types as an example, modeling as an example, um, and running those models as an example, I think can allow us to leap forward um, with these new technologies and make them part of our new uh, workflow. Thank that you, Dr. The yes, thank you, Dr. Morgan. Uh, does anyone else want to touch on this question before we move on? Okay, uh, let's go with Brian and then uh, Jennifer. Brian, you're on mute. All right, that's where everybody's supposed to take a swig or something. So uh, I wanted to say a little bit more about what Dr. Morgan mentioned earlier about modeling. Um, 
trying to do modeling smarter, better uh, is one of the mantras behind the unified forecast system. So right now we're running well over 20 operational modeling systems just for NWP coming out of EMC. At the end of a process of transitioning these UFS-based applications, we're gonna pare that down to 10 or less. So over a factor of uh, two, um, having in the number of operational systems we have to develop and maintain in operations. And so that economization really lets us uh, have resources available to suck in more of that innovation that we've been talking about. Jennifer? Sure, thank you. So I just wanted to kind of look at that last half. So we have a brand new model, for example, and we want to deliver it to operations. Really understanding the quality of that model from a couple perspectives, I think, is important. And this comes to you know our, our verification techniques and our testing, but it's understanding, okay, does a new product actually outperform the other product, not just in a particular skill score, but in the information that it's providing to the end user? Are we, is this model actually producing, you know, better lead times? Um, we understand start and stop times better. And so really analyzing that piece of information uh, is a, a very important part of making the decision for what we can replace and move new things into operations. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Uh, Margo, go ahead. Yeah, and I would just add that there, can be a period where there's actually increased requirements where you're running like a new tool in parallel with an existing tool so that you can adjust a, a long time series when you transition to a, what hopefully would be proven as a, a new and better more efficient tool and, uh, the example i'm thinking of is in our production of uh, hypoxic zone size for, forecast in the gulf of mexico it's traditionally been white ship based um, charter vessel and we're exploring the use of, of gliders that may be able to survey a, a longer time period in a bigger area. But we've got a 40 year time series that we need to marry with a new tool and a new set of data. And so how we, we do that, and we have to invest in that overlap time period to, to calibrate before we could move to the, the newer, better one. But I think it's, it's something that has real promise and is worth that kind of Thank you, Margo. I'm going to move on to our next audience question. With our increasingly Earth system perspective, the cross-line office collaboration is more important than ever. How can we best facilitate this? Go ahead, Jennifer. I'll take a stab at the question because I think it's so important. And I wanna use uh, some of the work we're doing in FIRE as an example. You know, when you think about the roles of the line offices in producing our products, developing the techniques, delivering those to operations, you, you can get an idea of how the different line offices fit together to make a full story for NOAA. So in the FIRE case, we have a really nice example where um, NESDA's National Weather Service and OAR has come together to really make that end-to-end -end story. You know, we get satellite data and new products from NESDA. So that comes into our research models. We, you know, integrate those new research models and we do it in the context of what operations needs to meet the needs at a fire line. And I think if we keep in mind kind of those roles, it it provides a natural way for us to come together and work together on a particular topic using FIRE as an example that can really then facilitate the communication and how we bring our tools to the table. And then it, it all, you know, it just sort of magically, you know, and I hate to say magic because it's <laughs> not always that easy, but you can bring what we do best to the table and start having those discussions. And we've been very successful in developing Kind of that broader picture so that we all have space and collaboration and know what our end goal is in delivering that so i would you know maybe starting with a topic which then brings the the best of all of what we do to the table i believe brian had his hand up next uh, what jen said thanks <laughs> I think Kevin has his hand up too. I, thanks for the question. I think it's a great one. Um, I, I would say a couple things. One, 
Um, we've invested a lot in NOAA cross line office functionality. I'm thinking of like NOAA regional collaboration. I'm thinking of like the the water team, the weather team, the climate team, you know, things like that, that, that we've invested a lot as an agency and working at different levels. Um, so I'd say one, we should use what we have. Um, and then two, I think we should be encouraging our workforce at every level to you know, spend time in other parts of the agency. Um, several of us on the screen, I know Joe, myself, um, you know, Bill, we, we, we've worked in different line offices and, and I think there's, there, you, you've learned something by moving from one line office to another and, and you always take a little bit of where you were or where you go. So I think the more of that we do, the stronger we're gonna be as an agency. I think the, the question is a, a great one for us to sort of keep our eye on the ball over time. Any last uh, answers for that question? Okay, we'll move on. I have a question here for Joe Pika. Let me pull that up. So is NCEI doing workshops, tutorials, or hack weeks for the science community? NASA's um, communities has been doing a lot of this for conferences and hosted community cloud data, cloud data hack weeks, but I haven't mm -hmm. seen anything like that from NCEI. And CEI, are there any plans or interest in that? Yeah, thanks for the question. I, I alluded to it in my my last answer, but I'll, I'll, I'll you know, expand on it a little bit. NCI is not typically doing it of and by itself. Uh, going towards that last question, it's been more of a, a NOAA-wide activity via the Environmental Data Management Workshop that goes on annually, or the NOAA Center for Artificial Intelligence intelligence uh, uh, annual workshops. And so we try to incorporate some of those hackathons or, or workshops as part of those activities that are more NOAA-wide, uh, where we have more representation. And, and actually, those, those workshops actually expand beyond that. Uh, in particular, the, we've opened up the AI workshop uh, quite broadly to even having foreign partners there in a virtual setting. So uh, that is, that is happening, not not necessarily with the NCEI flag on it, uh, even though we are active participants, but more with the the NOAA hat uh, from those uh, you know more broad uh, associations. Thank you for the question. Great, thank you, Joe. Our next question, very possibly our last question. Uh, is are there any of the line offices using or considering having change managers to manage and or facilitate the change in technologies, workflows, and responsibilities of the employees? Transitions have a significant impact on employees that can hamper the new efficiencies desired. I'll jump in first and just say that we, we you know, as, as SES, we all have change management as the the first uh, activity in our performance plans. Uh, so we all have a role uh, in in change management as we go forward. Uh, and uh, you know, it, it, it's a it's a, it's a daily challenge uh, for us to uh, to work on that. Kevin. Thanks, Joe. I was just going to say for NOAA Fisheries, we have a, a strategic initiative program where we invest in something for a period of years. Um, so currently we have strategic initiatives around genetics, genomics. Um, that's one. And then we have a second one and, and uh, technology to read fish odorless. Um, and and the, the intent there is that we, we make an affirmative commitment to fund some new technology development, including this kind of change component that you're talking about over a period of years, right? It's typically, I think, three to five years. Um, and, you know, we've, I think, seen some success with that. The Viami was the first strategic initiative in fisheries, and one of the first two that Dr. Morgan mentioned, and, and that's obviously held on all these years. So, yeah, I think we are doing that. And as Joe mentions, um, is leaders. That is something that we're, we're all striving to do as part of our, our daily um, work. So thanks for your question. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, just briefly in the weather service, uh, we've recently, um, and by recently, I mean last October, uh, instituted a change management unit 
Now, this isn't specifically for transitions to applications from research kind of things. It is really a change management unit, uh, alluding to what Joe and Kevin already talked about, um, where we are trying to bring everybody on board in terms of changing processes within the weather uh, within the national weather service in order to more effectively serve our, our stakeholders so change is, is just huge the transition problem is going to be part of that um, in the weather service but it's not just the transition problem Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, we have five minutes left, so I was going to throw it over to Fiona to see if she has any last questions or would like to inform everyone on the next uh, fireside chat. Um, great, uh, thanks, Katie. I do have more questions myself, but um, I'm sure that they will take another three hours. So I am going to say, um, seeing as we only have a few minutes left, so thank you so much to our panelists. Um, and thank you very much, Dr. Morgan, for joining us on this fireside chat. Um, I think that it's been very informative. Uh, we have had note takers um, who are going to develop a summary of this uh, fireside chat and the content of it. And it is also being recorded, so it will be posted on the um, ORTA website. Um, so um, there are, uh, while there are many things have been brought up already, and I, I did hear talk a little bit about it, and. Um, that was stalled transitions or transitions that do not go into operations or to use. And um, there are many reasons for that, and that has a very negative connotation. However, we don't want it to have a negative connotation because things become stalled or don't move into use for many different reasons. And that is actually going to be the subject of our next fireside chat, which will be in June. And um, I'm hoping you can all join us then. Um, I think that we will be convening a, a similar type of panel. We'll come to this group for recommendations as to how they want to address this particular topic. And I know, Dr. Morgan, this is something that um, uh, that is primary for you as well. So I'm going to ask Dr. Morgan if you would like to make any comments. About the future uh, yeah. fireside chat? Or about, about anything, or about this one and about the future, yes. No, well, I'd say, first of all, I mean, this has been a great discussion, I think, um, the line office representatives for their participation in this, as well as the audience questions that have come in. I want to say one last bit about the, you know, the change management uh, that was described in, in hiring change managers or bringing them in um, to facilitate that change. Obviously, you know, as folks that said SES level, folks have that as part of their, um, as part of the expectation of their job. And part of the change management also comes about by helping to develop, particularly when you're beginning to um, release new technologies, is having uh, developing communities of practice across NOAA to learn about how to use these new tools. So part of it's bringing in new technology, perhaps, but also making sure that those technologies can knit people together so they can effectively begin to embrace that. One of the things we're looking at for, as an example, for the artificial intelligence machine learning activities across NOAA is beginning to use um, the name of the tool just escapes me. Joe, help me with that if you Slack. don't mind. Slack as an example of making that sort of a corporate-wide um, tool that could be used to enhance our communications, help people that are looking and engaged in artificial intelligence activities to uh, talk about best practices, things of that sort. But recognizing that there's an impact of any sort of fundamental change to how we do our practices. We have to manage it carefully, make sure people are all on board, and also make sure that senior leadership is transparent and openly communicating what the uh, what the direction that we're going in is. And so that's something that I'm certainly uh, committed to doing. Um, but I think it's also going to be exciting in the June discussion to look at those aspects of things that have progressed through the uh, research readiness levels and don't quite make it understanding what were the pitfalls, but also making sure that we gather those lessons learned in that process because you know, in anything that we do, any human endeavor, even when things don't seem to work out, we can learn something from why they didn't work out and improve our processes all along. So thanks again for this opportunity. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Morgan, for those remarks. I'm gonna hand it back to Katie now um, with any final thoughts on the recording and the posting. Thank you so much, Fiona, and thank you all of our speakers today. Uh, as Fiona said, we did record this session, so it will be up on the library's YouTube, which I did put in the chat there. 
Um, you can find all the fireside chats there as well, but I see that it has hit two o'clock. So as a reminder, we did collect all of your questions and if we didn't get to them uh, in this session, they will be answered via email offline. And as Fiona said, there will be a summary of this talk. Please join us in June. I hope everyone has a lovely, safe and healthy rest of their day. Take care. Thank you all.